Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope it's still morning uh, or good day, um, depending on where you are currently. Um, I hope you enjoyed the first day of this Young Scientist Symposium. Um, the morning session of today is dedicated to theoretical methods for ultrafast dynamics. We will have um, six speakers in total. Uh, the first uh, one is Professor Klaus Muller, and he is the head of the physical and biophysical chemistry department at DTU. Uh, he joined DTU in 2002 as an assistant professor. And uh, since 2016, he's a full, full professor of chemistry. Um, he also obtained his PhD degree from DTU in 1997. Following that, he was a postdoc at Caltech with Professor Ahmed Zivel, and then a postdoc at Ecole Normale Superiore with Professor Casey Hines. Uh, his re research basically focuses on theoretical and computational chemical dynamics with emphasis on ultrafast time resolved techniques. Uh, one of his greatest strengths is his uh, extensive collaboration with experimental groups. Um, now I request Professor Muller to um, begin his uh, talk. Thank you, Tosha. Um, for the introduction. Let's just see if I can share my slides here. There we go. So uh, thank you for the introduction. And as Torsha said, um, I am uh, working closely with uh, a lot of uh, experimentalists. So, so the theory that I'm going to present is the theory of experiments, so to speak, or experimental uh, techniques uh, I chose for this uh, this. Um, meeting and uh, which I'm very happy to participate in. Thank you for the invitation. And I also chose it to be, um, I think at least a, a bit uh, educational uh, because some of the techniques that I'm going to present, maybe people are not so familiar with, with, with that. And I hope it will be beneficial for you to, to see how we uh, have done the theory on the experimental methods. The experimental method I'm going to talk about, let me just change the uh, pointer here. There we go. Is, uh, um, ultra-fast X-ray scattering. So, but first, as Torsha said, I'm at DTU, and show is she, by the way, uh, and I know that uh, therefore she and others know what DTU is, but some uh, some of you may not know. So I uh, just wanted to present a bit of uh, where we are. So this is Europe, this is Denmark, this is Copenhagen, here, and just uh, some 10 kilometers north of Copenhagen, you have this huge campus of the Technical University of Denmark in the green area of uh, the Northern Sealand. It was founded by uh, Ørsted, the person, of course, who discovered the um, um, correspondence or, or the connection between electricity and, and magnetism. At that time, it was uh, in the center of Copenhagen, but it moved up north as the technology uh, grew and the, the demand for the technology grew. DTU is part of what's called a Eurotech, which is seven of the universities in Europe that have uh, joined together uh, for, for common uh, projects, students exchange, and, and so forth. And this is how uh, the Department of Chemistry looks. If you know uh, Danish architecture from the 60s, you recognize that that is exactly what this is. These are the people, so I don't forget, uh, that have um, participated to, in the work that I'm going to present. So at DTU Chemistry, it's my longtime colleague, uh, Professor Niels Henriksen, and, and then uh, some very, very good students and postdocs we've had over the years, uh, these four mentioned here. Uh, these two mostly on experimental work and these two mostly on the theoretical work I'm, I'm going to present. And then at DTU, we are very fortunate to have a very strong uh, ultra-fast uh, scattering, X-ray scattering group at DTU Physics, headed by Professor Martin Nielsen and senior scientist Christopher Heltrop. And these are some of the students that have been in their group uh, over the years that have participated uh, in the work that I'm going to present. And then a uh, uh, very strong collaboration also over many, many years with Kelly Gaffney at Slack at Stanford at the LCLS uh, Free Electron Laser. Uh, so he, if that's on the experimental work, and then Adam Caranda at the University of Edinburgh, who uh, we have collab start collaboration with more recently on the theoretical work. And these are the guys who paid for the research over the years. So what is ultrafast uh, X-ray scattering? Well, as all ultrafast experiments, it's, it's a pump probe technique. So th this is the sample. This is the pump, pump optical pulse that excites the sample. And then the blue is the uh, high frequency X-ray pulse that then enters uh, and, and, and interacts with the excited uh, probe. 
uh, on which it scatters, and then from the scattering pattern, you can you can uh, deduce, or hopefully you can deduce, what is the state of the excited uh, sample. So that's the idea. Where can you do such things? You can do that five places around the world at the free electron lasers uh, shown here on the map. A six is coming up in, in China in a few years. Uh, it's it's very hard to create short pulses of um, a hard X-ray, so it requires a big machine, a free electron laser, uh, and these are the places where you can find these. Uh, we mostly go to the uh, LCLS uh, in, in California. That was also the first one that opened in uh, Northern California. And then, of course, the European XFL in Hamburg, because it's very close by, and then uh, Switzerland, Korea, and uh, Japan. So this is us doing experiments at LCLS. It's, it's a picture that dates uh, a few years back. So it's a very intense X-ray. So this is the this is the hutch, or this is the the, the optical table. This is the the screen where you pick up the photons, the scattered photons, and you can't be in the room when you do the experiment. So there's a control room apart. So you set up everything, then then you close the door, and then you go to the control room and you and you do uh, everything from there. And here I am star staring at the high technology uh, plastic bag uh, because I don't really participate in the actual touching of equipment, uh, they won't let me. So I'm just uh, standing there and then talking about science and, and, and data uh, while, while we're there. So when uh, these uh, free election lasers were announced in uh, around 2005, uh, we set out to, 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 to think about how would, uh, how would one theoretically describe an experiment done at such a facility. And we looked in the, in the, in the books and found that none of them describe uh, a, a, a um, time-dependent X-ray field interacting with a moving or, or time-dependent sample, which is what you have after you excite with the pump. Um, they, they all describe the, the static uh, X-ray scattering. So this is the scattering cross-section at some uh, solid angle, which is the uh, scattering from one electron times the scattering factor, uh, which is the uh, electronic matrix element of the scattering operator, uh, this guy. And if you work on this, you can work out that that's uh, basically the Fourier transform of the uh, electron density. So that would be the scattering signal that you get. You get a, a picture of, of the electron density or, or the Fourier transform of the electron density. How do you get to this expression? Well, first of all, you neglect, this, uh, you neglect the scattering from nuclei. Of course, photons could also scatter from the nuclei, but it's an insignificant uh, contribution to the scattering signal. Then you assume you are in a stationary molecular state so you just have one electronic state here, usually the uh, ground state, of course. And then your field state is also stationary. Uh, so you have uh, uh, one eigenstate of the field scatter into another eigenstate of the field. Uh, and this is the perturbation that describes the scattering. And then you put all that together and then you get to this expression. None of this works, of course, for the time dependent situation where you don't have a stationary molecular state. You have something that moves. You want to start at dy dynamics and you don't have a stationary uh, uh, electric field because you want to have a pulse of photons. Uh, they're not there. They're not there. Now they're there. And then they were gone again. So you want to build time dependence into that. And we wanted to describe how to do that. And then uh, because that will tell us how to interpret the experiments. I should say. Uh, that you can make an even simpler approximation to, to actually doing the Fourier transform of the uh, electron density, the full electron density of the molecule, uh, you can actually assume that, that the scattering factor is uh, composed of scattering from each of the uh, individual atoms with their individual scattering factor or form factor. Uh, and then you have uh, the scattering in between these different atoms. That's called the independent atom model. So the atoms always carry around the electrons as they were free in the world. And then you just have these blobs of, of atoms with their electrons on, in them. And then they scatter in between uh, the, these uh, fixed electron clouds at each atom. All right, so as I said, uh, we have to lift the, the restriction of the molecular state being uh, stationary. So we make a wave packet as you uh, hopefully uh, no. So you expand on the electronic states and on each electronic state, you have an amplitude, which is the nuclear wave packet on, on that electronic state. Uh, and then we also uh, have an incoming field, which is a time dependent state that scatters into each of the uh, directions of the eigenstates of the field. And then you pick up all that to get the total uh, scattering signal. I should say that the work we did here was actually inspired by work from the 90s, from the Wilson, Kent Wilson, Ahmed Swale groups, uh, who already predicted in the 90s that at some point it will be possible to do time dependent scattering. So they started to work on the theory already then. 
all right, so we have the interaction of Hamilton only. That's, of course, the same as before. The theory is the same. We just change which stage we're working on. So this would be the first order perturbation uh, theory uh, change in the molecular state due to the interaction uh, with the field where this is the uh, this is the, uh, interaction on the molecule being the uh, photon uh, matrix element of the interaction Hamiltonian. And, and then you just measure the, 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 the size of that perturbation and that's proportional to the size of the scattering signal when you multiply by the frequency density of photons in a, a solid angle at that particular frequency. So that's what you have to, to do. So how do you construct a time-dependent uh, field uh, state? Well, you can do that exactly the same way as you uh, do in molecular science. You make a wave packet of field states instead of a wave packet of electronic states or nuclear states. So just make it a, a, a coherent superposition of, of field eigenstates where this is some kind of Bell distribution in, in energy. And then you can convince yourself that if you then look at the time dependence of the field, for instance, expressed as the intensity, that becomes also a Bell function, this one, uh, which is a Fourier transform of those coefficients, and that looks like a Bell function in both time and position. So you have this, this Bell function uh, arriving at your sample with a certain uh, time envelope. So again, much like, like you would do in, in molecular science, it works also in, in, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, on the electric field by making this these uh, Bell distribution energy becomes Bell distribution uh, in time. In fact, this, which is a purely quantum mechanical field, looks very much like the classical field you would create if you wanted to have a pulsed field. Then you have that um, field state, you can plug it in and you can evaluate the photon matrix element of the interaction Hamiltonian, it becomes this, we don't have to go into details. And then you take that and you plug it in uh, here, and then you take the, the uh, norm of that, and then you get to this expression for this uh, scattering signal per energy per solid angle. And what do we have here? We have the Heisenberg transform of the scattering operator. The scattering operator was something that looks very much like this. So of course you refine that here when you take this and you square it. Then you have something here, which is the coherence function of the, uh, the photon field. And then you have something here that's called the duration of the photon field. And then it may not be uh, necessarily the same. They are only the same if the fields are truly uh, coherent. Uh, in most uh, free electron lasers, you actually have uh, a bunch of coherent uh, pulses within the overall pulse, and that you can easily get from this expression by just extending how far this duration of the fault, uh, pulse reaches. We also made the approximation here that all the electrons feel the same time envelope of the uh, photon pulse. So no matter where you sit in the molecule, you feel the same time envelope, and that's because the, the broadness of the, the pulse as, a, as it arrives on the molecule is much broader than, than the molecule itself. So all the electrons feel the same time variation in the field. And this coherence function here is related to the uh, frequency distribution of your field. Again, very much like you would have in, in molecular science. So you have a time function and you have a an energy function, which are uh, others uh, Fourier transform. But the important uh, point here is that it's the coherence of the field, the coherence length of the field that determines what the frequency distribution is in the field. Uh, and that again, as I said, you might sum up many of uh, these coherent pulses to get the, the, uh, the final pulse. So what are the typical XFEL parameters? Well, it's hard X-ray. So, you know, you are around 10 kilo electron volt uh, in, in energy of the photons. The, the uh, spread in the energy of photons, that guy there, is about one per mil of that, so that's 10 EV. Again, here, this is roughly, this, this could be 20, this could be five, so it's just orders of magnitudes. The coherence uh, time of, of such a pulse is around one femtosecond. The duration of a pulse at an XFL is around 100 femtoseconds. Again, it could be 50, but it's the order of magnitude. So you can see the pulse is much longer than the coherence time, so it's actually a bunch of, of smaller pulses. Uh, and, and the difference between coherence time and actual time length of the pulse is very important because a coherent field interacts different with the molecular sample than an incoherent field. So you, uh, you calculate all the small coherent contributions and then you add them up incoherently. All right, uh, so this is the expression. Let's move on and, and, and work on, on this guy and see if we can do something about this. It makes it a little bit more easy to manipulate further on. So here it is. First, we, we plug in this, this uh, Bond Wang exp uh, expansion of the, 
molecular uh, wave uh, packet that we talked about. So we expand it on each of the electronic states with their, with their weight on them, which then becomes the molecular uh, wave packet on that state. Plug that in here, plug in the electronic ident the identity, expand it into electronic states there. And then you get this expression, where in this expression, uh, I have made a little uh, trick. I have used the adiabatic approximation. So when I have an electronic state, you, you, so here we have the, uh, the molecular Hamiltonian there. So if uh, in an electronic basis, if I use an adiabatic electronic basis during the time of the coherence, which is only about one femtosecond. So everything's adiabatic on the time scale of one femtosecond. That's not an unreasonable uh, approximation. Then I can just take what is the molecular Hamiltonian for the nuclei on that electronic state. And that's this one. So that's what we have here. Uh, and then here we have the electronic matrix elements of the scattering operator, the ones that also showed up, as I showed, in the uh, static theory. The important thing here is, though, that we have a lot of off-diagonal elements, and that's the whole part of some of my talk. I have to talk about those. Um, all right, so we have this expression. Then we have these uh, nuclear uh, Hamiltonians or nuclear uh, time evolution operators acting on the nuclear wave packet. Since they only act while there's coherence in the field, uh, that's what there's the time delta here, uh, that's a very short time. So we can approximate that by saying, by ignoring the kinetic energy operator on that and just keep the potential energy operator. And then we can, uh, as a, it's not a necessary approximation, just makes the equation nicer. Uh, we can actually say, we can say, well, the, if the electronic energy not, doesn't vary too much compared with the overall energy we have in the, in, in the system, many electron volts, as you saw before, the, 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 the width of the pulse is on the order of, of 10 electron volts, and I will come back to it, can it be even much more? So we have many, many, many electronic states in play. So maybe the variation in energy on each of them is not so important. We can just have some average electronic energy for each state. If we plug that in, then we get this final expression for the um, scattering. Uh, into this solid angle per that energy uh, from one ele per electron, this ratio. And then we have this, uh, this uh, mean value, or, or it's actually a, a cross value between the molecular wave packet at different electronic states of this product of scattering operators. So you are in uh, this L state, that's, that's if you are in the L electronic state, which is part of the uh, molecular wave packet, you scatter to all other states, then you scatter to, from all, 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 those, all those other states back to some molecular state. Again, one that has to be in the wave packet because this one came from that expansion. And you sum all that up. That's, I hate this guy. Um, then you sum all that up over time, and then you multiply by this weighing factor, uh, which is uh, the pulse width, where you weigh how important are all these uh, matrix elements uh, and that depends on how far away you go in energy uh, uh, intermediate energy state n from where uh, from the states that are included in the wave packet l and m to begin with so when you have a detector you don't distinguish uh, when you the detector just sits somewhere and collects all the electrons that the, or, or all the photons that arrive uh, and it doesn't uh, detect necessarily between the energy it just adds all of the photons up with different energies within a window. So we can we integrate the signal over the detector window delta uh, omega, and then we get this final expression, uh, which is the same as before, except that the uh, weighing by the, uh, the magnitude of the uh, uh, width of the pulse in, in energy space is amplified by, if you can pick up all of the uh, photons of different energy. You don't, you don't have to punish that you change the photon energy a lot from the incoming because you still pick it up by the uh, detector. So this, the, 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 uh, the, the photon energy spread in the incoming pulse is like the minimum of the photons you pick up. But uh, if you only sit and pick up, um, let's say at, at the incoming photon energy, then because of the pulse width around that, you can still have photons coming from somewhere else entering to, to, to the uh, incoming photon uh, energy by uh, inelastic scattering. So you'll pick those up. And then the broader you, you make the detector window, the more photons you can pick up. All right. So now we have uh, this expression. Uh, and that expression includes three important terms. Uh, we have the purely elastic scattering, where we uh, the, the wave packet that lives on different electronic states. If you only scatter into that same electronic state and you scatter back to that 
a part of the molecular wave function, you get uh, L, uh, M and N being equal. So that's a purely electronic scattering situation. Then you have a situation where you, you scatter from the same molecular state, uh, electronic states to the same molecular electronic state, but via other electronic states than this one. So you go L to N and N back to L. So that's still, let's say, elastic uh, on the uh, molecular uh, states, but it's inelastic on the electronic states. And then you have the what we call the coherent mixed states, where the scattering event takes you from one electronic state within the wave packet to another electronic state within the wave packet via all these other, uh, electronic states that you uh, might have in between. Um, and this I will come back to uh, in a minute. But first, let me just talk about the first term here and assume that's the only one that really counts. Arguments can be made. Uh, they're not very solid, but let's just assume that arguments can be made and look only at the first term, the elastic part, um, and uh, manipulate it. Here we see that here we have a product of uh, matrix elements in the same electronic state of the scattering operator, but that's exactly what we had back here. That's exactly what this is. Here was the ground state, but it could be any state. And that we identified as the scattering factor. So we will, of course, do the same here. So that's the scattering factor. And then you just have to take the uh, average value of that over the, uh, the molecular uh, wave packet in that electronic state. That's just the norm of the wave packet if you, if you project things onto configuration space. Um, but still, you have to calculate the, the scattering factor, which is the Fourier transform of the electron density in each electronic state that is included in your molecular uh, wave packet. You could go on and make a further approximation, say, well, the, they are not too different. If, if, if we have very heavy atoms with a lot of uh, electrons in them, then whether you excite, let's say, uh, a few valence electrons, <clears throat> if you still have, uh, I don't know, 30 electrons in, in your uh, atom, they are mostly unaffected by that. So maybe the scattering factor is not so different in between electronic states. If you make that approximation, it is an approximation and it precludes you from studying yeah, electron dynamics, uh, but you could study structural dynamics, which is what I'm uh, getting at with this analysis uh, and say, well, let's just assume that, that uh, the electrons uh, sc scatter the same in, in a given configuration, whether that configuration is in uh, ground state, excited state, whatever. So it's the same configuration, and we don't care about what the electron, uh, the electron which, which state the electrons uh, are in. And the most grotesque version of that approximation is to, as I said before, just assume that all the atoms are completely unaffected by the fact that they're in a molecule. So the scattering is just a sum of the scattering in between uh, atomic uh, uh, form factors. That's called, again, the independent atom model, which is very useful in, in scattering. Now, if we do photodynamics, what we do is we excite with a laser and then we measure with, with a, a X-ray probe pulse. And then we take the difference of those. So we excite and, uh, and, and get a scattering image. And then we, we uh, uh, measure the scattering image without having excited. And then we calculate the difference. And since the only thing that can change is now this, this uh, distribution of configurations that you have at a given time, you just have to say that the scattering image you get uh, the, the, the change in the scattering is due to the change in molecular structure as a function of time. And then you can do your structural dynamics. Also uh, be aware that I rearranged here. So this is what we call the instantaneous signal. And that's what I'm gonna work on uh, further on in the theory. And then you just have to re remember that everything I say, you would have to afterwards average over the extension of the um, X-ray field. All right. Uh, I will skip a lot of that uh, because that is not so necessary. Let's show how it actually works in practice uh, and, and make some chemical bonds. Uh, we have studied uh, these two very similar molecules uh, where we have two metal atoms here. Uh, it's called PGPOP, it's called Iridium diamond. Uh, and they have the feature that these two metal atoms are not chemically bound in the ground state. So the ground state is a very fluffy thing depending on the rigidity of the, of the framework. But basically these two atoms are held close to each other uh, due to this framework. But then when you excite the molecule, you form a chemical bond in between the two atoms. So now they are, they are, they are uh, chemically bound uh, to each other. So that's the formation of a chemical bond. Uh, let's see if we can see that in, in, 
in, in an X-ray uh, experiment. And we chose this because, again, uh, these metals, they have many electrons, so they scatter a lot. They are easy to follow in a scattering experiment. Uh, optical experiments were done confirming that, that picture. Uh, this is for the, for the PG pop molecule. Uh, we did uh, some simulations of this system, and we start out with the complicated stuff. The complicated stuff is to take one of these big molecules, throw them in a solution, uh, and then excite them and see what happens. So we need somehow, this is a different molecule, I apologize, but nevertheless, the technique is the same. So we have the, the molecule with the, where we change the electronic state, and then we have a solvent around it, and we follow that by doing uh, QMM molecular dynamics, uh, which means that we do the, the nuclei classically uh, uh, on uh, forces that are calculated by quantum chemistry coupled to a molecular mechanics solvent. And we create a ground state by just running a long simulation. And then we take some different configurations from that ground state and, and, and change the, the electronic state to the excited state. And then they make up a, a excited state wave pack. And then we follow that in time as illustrated here. So the, the green one, is the ground state distribution of, this is the, the, the PG pop version of it. So this is the distance between two platinums. So the green one here is the ground state distribution. And then we ex take some of those configurations, we dig a hole, so to speak, and, and put on the excited state. Uh, and then it looks uh, something like this when we let the dynamics go. I should say, uh, these are just one-dimensional uh, extractions from a full simulation. The black curves are just there to guide the eye. We did a full simulation with, with the forces calculated on, on the fly, including all the, the atoms. As you can see, you get this vibration uh, in, in the excited state uh, and, and, and nothing in the ground state because you're excited right in the middle. Uh, and uh, those uh, vibrations die out and that you, then you have formed the chemical bond here. You see the distance is much shorter at uh, the end. This we took to an XFEL uh, laser. Um, so uh, this is the iridium diamond uh, we did first. So here you see the ground state trajectory, huge fluctuations, about one angstrom. They're not really bound. Uh, you, you excite them and then you see immediately the, the distance shrinks. So that's much less coherent than the other one I showed. So about three angstrom and we also see, so, uh, see some other motion in the molecules, a breathing of the molecule and a twist of the molecule. That's what we saw in the simulations. Then we did the experiments. Uh, having the same ideas in mind. Uh, so there was a contraction, uh, there was a, a twist, uh, and then we plugged plug that into the uh, uh, fitting of the experimental uh, data that came out, and it fitted uh, very, very well, but there still was a, as you can see here, this is the uh, contraction, and this is the twist, uh, and this is what we got out of the fit to the experimental uh, data, uh, putting those components, the, the scattering uh, um, signals co corresponding to that dynamics into the anal anal uh, analysis of the data. We got this pretty good match in the time evolution, pretty happy, but there was a residual. And then we looked at the residual at different times. So the fit was not perfect, of course. And then we looked at the uh, simulation and realized that the molecules just around these, uh, the water molecule, uh, the solvent molecules just around the, the complex here if we only looked at the scattering from those, the, those scattering signals from, gotten from the simulation look very much like what we couldn't fit in the experimental result. What are these? These are um, from early at a time and late time. And then we realized that at early time, you had a desolvation. So because of the contraction of the molecule, the solvent molecules kind of stayed behind. So the a vacuum was created here in very loose terms. And then we later on had that the, uh, nitrogen end of the uh, zero nitrile swung in uh, and, and, and re coordinated these uh, metal atoms. So we had two physical processes that we, we uh, could identify happening at early and late time. So, so that was the physics we put into to these two. Then we took these two and put them into the fitting and refitted and saw that they showed up in the uh, experimental fit very much with the time. Uh, the evolution of the uh, desolvation and re-coordination. So we believe that the experimental, uh, the experiment was actually able to resolve desolvation and coordination um, of this molecule as a function of time. So this was a, an, uh, an analysis where we had the same thing we didn't understand, looked at the simulation, what could it be, put it back into the simulation, then the simulation uh, showed exactly the same, the, oh, sorry, then the fit showed exactly the same as the simulation. So that fit uh, could very well be interpreted as those processes. 
Then we repeated that using the PG pop, but a bit different. Instead of exciting in the middle of, of the absorption band, we excited on the side. What happens when you excite on the side? Well, then you excite right very close to the bottom of the excited state well, but very much on the side of the ground state well. And since what you detect, there are differences. You detect both something you created and something you left behind as a whole. Uh, and you get vibrate much stronger vibration in the ground state than you did in the excited state, the way you excited it. Uh, so that we also simulated. And here is the experiment. Uh, and here's the simulation, and there's a pretty good correspondence, so we were pretty happy with that. But you might ask, and so what? Why is this important? You only took one term. Well, the importance was that that one term actually is very useful for studying structural dynamics. And as I said, arguments can be made for uh, systems with many electrons and fast decoherence because of many interactions. These two terms that I here deleted uh, don't really matter much. But then why did you write them, you might ask, if you just throw them away? Well, because for some systems, they do matter much. If you take a system that's much smaller, where you can study it much more in detail, and that's also where the atom chemistry comes in, because much more in detail also means much faster. So we thought we had looked at molecular vibration in big systems. Why don't we look at my molecular vibration in small systems where we can look at finer details? And what is smaller than the H2? So we, we uh, so let's, let's look at the theory again from the point of view of not usefulness in interpreting experiments in a rough sense, but really to suggest new experiments if it were possible to do all this on an at a second time scale with very, very high resolution. So this is H2. So we, we uh, made a theoretical simulation. I don't like that, all simulations are theoretical. We, we, we did a simulation using the theory, all the theory. So these are high level quantum chemistry, um, uh, uh, potential energy curves for the ground state and for the excited state. Uh, we excited with a femtos, uh, 25 femtosecond uh, pulse, uh, optical pulse at 14.3 EV. That brings you to the B state. Uh, we used a, a pulse strength that excited about 10%. And here you see the, the weight packet uh, bouncing back and forth uh, in the uh, upper B state well between uh, around uh, 0.7 uh, and 5 uh, angstrom. Also here showed down here is the overlap of the wave function part in the excited state and the wave function part that was left behind in the ground state. And you see that only at specific times and of course only around this distance, there's an overlap between the excited state wave function and the ground state wave function. Here are the scattering images. We used a hundred at a second uh, X-ray pulse in the simulation, uh, 8.5 uh, kilo electron volts and a window, as I said, uh, which is a combination of the width of the pulse and how many photons you can you can detect on your detector of 50 eV, which collects then photons from nine different electronic states in the H2 molecule. And here we see the, the scattering images, the, uh, the elastic part, the one I call the inelastic part, and then the, the cross term. And you can see the elastic part that I already showed uh, previously for, for bigger molecules also here has variation this is half a vibrational period, so that's when the molecule is here. That's a full vibrational period, that's here. That's three halves, four, uh, two, five halves, and so forth. So you see variation in that one. That one could certainly be interpreted in terms of, of structure. Then we have this one. It is not insignificant. It's smaller than that one. Uh, and we don't really know, I don't have much to say about it, that if you throw, that if the uh, collected the full signal, you might be in trouble if you couldn't separate these two because I don't really know how to interpret that at the moment. And then we have the cross term here. The important thing about the cross term is that look at the symmetry. It has different symmetry. These two are symmetric around the, uh, the y-axis, uh, whereas this one is not. So this one could be isolated from the total signal without uh, having to know these two, you could just take what is the asymmetric part and you could isolate this part of the signal. Why would that be interesting? Well, that is because it measures coherence in the system. So uh, if, if uh, we look at this picture that I had before, so every time the excited state wave packet reaches where the ground state wave packet is, there's an overlap between the two that you can measure uh, and, uh, and call it coherence. And that's the, the red curve here, right? So at every time, Every full vibrational period, you see that you come in here, you come in here, and you have, uh, this is the magnitude of this uh, cross term, the coherence cross term. 
and she beats exactly at that uh, frequency. So if you measured this, you would measure when you have overlap between uh, uh, parts of the wave functions in different electronic states. So you can measure coherence. Uh, and coherence is something that happens, for instance, also when you go through a conical intersection. So when you go through a conical intersection, your wave packet splits up and you have coherence in between um, wave packets at different electronic states. If you, if you would measure, uh, if you could extract from your total signal, this one, which you can in this, uh, this, point, uh, this instance because it has a different symmetry, you could extract it and you can say, whenever it has a magnitude, something is going on where different electronic states talk to each other. And that could be very important for locating in time. As I said, for instance, when do you go through a conical intersection? You have, however, to, to, to be fast to do it in time because there's also electronic beating in, in, in the signal, right? Uh, because it measures electronic coherence, or at least this is faced with electronic coherence. Uh, if we just go back to what the signal looks like, it's like this, so you have wave packet on one state and wave packet on the other state, but you also have something in between. But if you just took this in between out, then it's just the coherence between these states. Uh, and that was what was measured in, in the red. But of course, it, it, me so it measures it, but, but scattering wise. Uh, but if you zoom in to, to just the coherence term, of course, that one oscillates uh, on an electronic time scale of 300 attoseconds. There's a difference in energy of 14 uh, electron volts. If you convert that to time, that's 300 attoseconds. So underneath the nuclear beating, there's a very fast electronic beating. And you can also see that here in the signal, uh, how, it, how it changes, even changes phase on this time scale of the electronic beating of 300 attoseconds. So be able to, able to see this and not smear it out. You have to be fast enough not to integrate over the electronic beating, which we did here with 100 attoseconds, but you have to be that fast. So if you are that fast, and that's the attosecond part, if you are that fast, then you could uh, monitor not only structural dynamics, but also electronic dynamics in the terms of when uh, and when not do you have coherence between the electronic states. That's all I had. Thank you for your attention. And here we are at the XFL 2019, when the world was very, very different. We hope to go back uh, at some point soon. Uh, these are the guys from D2 Physics, uh, Martin Nielsen and Christopher Heldrup. Uh, and uh, these are some of the former students that are now uh, beamline scientists uh, around the world that joined us. And um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Oh, thanks a lot, Klaus. Um, um, very fascinating talk. Uh, sorry, I will introduce myself. I'm Juan Omiste. I'm from the Universi Universidad Complutense de Madrid. I'm part of the organizing committee. Sorry for the delay. I had a familiar issue. Uh, schools for kids mainly. And Torsha made me the favor of start this session. So um, I joined a little bit late, but the talk was fascinating. Thanks a lot. And so if anyone has any question, please go ahead. You can raise your hand or write in the chat. And um, first, I, I will ask you something. Sorry, because you may mention it and I skip it. Sorry, um, I missed it. Uh, you were talking about correlation in the, uh, in the light sources you were using. And you, well, you, uh, you are assuming that the light is around the, the femtoseconds uh, time, right? Uh, is it possible to to apply your or to extend somehow your framework to lights whose correlation time is smaller? I mean, because there are some studies uh, dealing with sunlight, of course, that the correlation time is extremely small, but of course they have to go, they cannot work in the Schrodinger picture or anything like that. So I, I was wondering, I, I guess it's pretty tough. <laughs> no, I, 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 I mean, um, I, I, I believe the equations are robust enough to work. The, the thing is, if you have very uh, uh, short coherence time, then you would get a much broader energy spectrum in, 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 your, in your pulse. And that would wash out a lot of the effects. So you might not be able to see as much. Yeah, I see. So <laughs> makes sense. OK. Thanks. So uh, I question? have a question. Yes, I have a question. Can I ask? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello, Klaus. <laughs> so thank you very much for the nice talk. So I have actually two questions about your experiment on uh, pool PT uh, or theoretical study of pool PT. So the first question is that um, you can see that uh, uh, 
uh, excitation to the first excited state, right? And you didn't right. consider any um, any processes like uh, conical intersections or excitation to any other excited state. So, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, so whether you had reasons for that or kind of you're quite sure that it is uh, it's true? Yes, uh, I, I had reasons for that mm -hmm. um, because if we just go back here mm -hmm. a second, um, the thing is that these are, <laughs> despite mm -hmm. the simplicity, very heavy calculations. Yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. because what you have to calculate mm -hmm. if you want to calculate that's of course why people make approximations yeah. uh, mm -hmm. because if you stay only with the with the um uh, uh i can't talk about with diagonal elements here as mm -hmm. i said you could even make this independent atom model approximation all of this uh so you don't even have to deal with the electron density mm -hmm. here as soon as you get the off diagonal elements you you there's no other way at least i don't know any other way than doing it brute force Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and e so to calculate this one and mm -hmm. this one, so so even if we just stayed on the same molecular mm -hmm. state, so we mm -hmm. had two two states in the molecule, ground state and excited state. Mm -hmm. Then, because of the width of the laser and the de detector, mm -hmm. we had nine intermediate states. So that's eighteen mm -hmm. different uh, uh, matrix elements of the scattering operator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then to take an average over, I have to calculate those eighteen matrix elements mm -hmm. on a grid in R mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. So that may be 1,800 yeah, yeah. matrix mm -hmm. elements mm -hmm. that I have to calculate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And that takes an enormous amount of time. But yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, of course, we should extend to all these other... Uh, so other I didn't stuff. want to, to criticize or whatever. No, 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 I just I, was I, wondering... I, I, whether, I didn't whether, take it that way either. Uh, whether, it is like, whether it's like we are allowed uh, to do it's, this. It's, it's a very emerging mm -hmm. field. Uh, yes, Adam Caranda, yes. mm -hmm. with whom I'm collaborating, is, is pioneering mm -hmm. the calculation of these uh, electronic uh, mm -hmm. matrix mm -hmm. elements of the scattering operator mm -hmm. uh, on uh, the off-diagonal ones. And it's mm -hmm. very it's very heavy, and, and nobody does it. I mean, so mm -hmm. so it is... We took H2 in this simple sense, uh, mm -hmm. sense because we were the first to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you, yeah. you take the easy one because you, you, you have the chance when you're the first. <laughs> so yeah, another question was that I didn't quite get these differences when you said, uh, again, with this PT between two different experimental conditions, when you said that you were a little bit offset of the edge, and when you got with uh, more pronouncing oscillations in the ground state, that I actually didn't get this idea. Could you please like uh, yes, yes, maybe yes, explain a little yes. bit more? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is the one, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So basically, it, just if we if we mm -hmm. are very simple minded, let's just assume mm -hmm. that this is kind of a Gaussian or this is a symmetric function. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the absorption maximum would be where you have uh, most uh, population in the ground state. Mm -hmm. Basically, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you absorb here, then you absorb in the middle of this guy. So it's still symmetric. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the average, so even though it starts to, to, the whole starts to move back and forth a bit, on average, the distribution stays symmetric. So the average structure remains the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas on the excited state, you excite on a slope, you, you make something here, mm -hmm. and that of course will vibrate back and yes. forth. Yes, yes. So that's mm -hmm. why you get vibration in the excited mm -hmm. state and not mm -hmm. so much in the ground state uh -huh. if you excite in the middle. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you excite on, on the wing, mm -hmm. You excite right into the bottom of the excited mm -hmm. state, mm -hmm. whether you have no forces, so you just stay there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas yes. the hole is now where you do have forces in the ground state, mm -hmm. so the hole starts to oscillate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And since in a diff, when you make a, a scattering experiment, you see changes, mm -hmm. so that something is missing somewhere also shows up in your scattering mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. experiment. So this one is kind of not moving and the missing part of that one is moving back and forth because mm -hmm. it starts to vibrate because it started out on a slope. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, that make sense? No. yes, 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 now I go with it, yes, yeah. thank you, thank right. you. Now it went very silent. Is someone there? Juan, are you there? Uh, 
Apparently not. Someone else? I mean, I, I, could, I can show the slides that I skipped your, on, on the way. <laughs> no, uh, no, that would be very nice, but perhaps we are constrained by time. Sure. So uh, thank you, Klaus, once again, for giving this very, uh, also very educational talk. <laughs> well, thank uh, you for the opportunity. Uh, so now I request um, the next speaker, Dr. Stefanos Karlstrom from Lund University. And um, he will be talking on Freeman resonances as the source for dynamic symmetry breaking. Stefanos, I request you to start. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Sorry. I'm back. I'm back. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, well, my internet was gone. I'm very sorry. So, thanks a lot, uh, Klaus, for your nice talk. And why, um, we now proceed with uh, Stefanos Karlstrom yeah, yeah. from Lund University. Uh, you so can see my screen? Stefanos, and I cannot see it, but my connection is not pretty good at this moment. We can see it, uh, Stefanos. Uh-huh. Very good. Oh, okay, you so can all, please, you can only hear me. So. Yeah, thanks. Yes, the stage is yours. Thanks for the nice introduction and thank you. I also would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present the work I've been doing as a postdoc at the Max Born Institute in Berlin and continuing at, uh, as a postdoc at Lund University. Um, I will start by introducing the, the problem and the uh, basic mathematical tools I'm using. But first off, I would like to thank the my immediate collaborators on this particular project, Misha Ivanov and Sergei Pachkovsky at the um, Max Born Institute and uh, Markus Dahlström at Lund University. And then I would like to remind you what a density matrix is. Uh, <clears throat> it's an object we can use to measure the coherence between different subparts of a system. And it's formed from the outer product of the wave function with itself. In this particular case, I'm expanding over a close coupling expansion of the of an atom, so ionic states, a photoelectron with a specific momentum and spin uh, on the bra side and on the ket side, I have a similar expansion set. Um, if we want to measure the coherence between two ionic states only and resolved on the photoelectron energy, we have to trace out the degrees of freedom that we don't observe. So in this case, it would be the angular degrees of freedom of the photoelectron and the spin. Uh, epsilon is the kinetic energy of the photoelectron. Um, we can then sum over the diagonal of this uh, reduced density matrix, and then we get back the normal photoelectron spectrum. Um, if we then further uh, integrate out the photoelectron energy, then we get the ionic coherence only. Uh, and we can normalize this with respect to the population in each of the channels, and we get the reduced quantity called degree of coherence. Uh, for this to be non-zero, it's important that we have uh, overlap between the photoelectrons on the bra side and on the ket side. And in particular, this means that we need to have energetic overlap and they need to have spatial symmetry such that the uh, integration over the angles and the summation of the spin uh, is non-zero. So that would, for instance, require that they have at the same, at one per specific photoelectron energy, we need to have the same parity of the photoelectrons. And this is this will become very important later. Now, let me briefly talk about above threshold ionization as we usually consider it in the strong field case. So we have an atom in its ground state, then we apply a really strong uh, laser field. This will tilt the potential such that we form a barrier and the valence electrons can tunnel out. Uh, the, Wave packet we now have in a continuum can be accelerated by the field um, and it can possibly come back to the parent ion and rescatter. And um, that after, this, after this, we can detect the photoelectrons. The rescattering of the photoelectron on the ion can accelerate the electron, but it can also change the ion state. And this is also very important uh, uh, later in the talk. The periodicity in time of this process uh, means that we will observe photoelectron peaks, which are separated by the photon energy omega. And here is an example spectrum, which is calculated uh, of ATI from xenon. Um, 
And we can see a few different characteristic features, which are uh, due to the inherent properties of the process. So um, specifically below twice the ponder motive energy of the field, uh, there, uh, we can observe direct electrons because they cannot reach higher energies than this. Uh, across the whole spectrum, we can also observe rescattered electrons because they can reach all the way up to 10 uh, times the ponder motive energy. This, ex this explains why we in the low energy regions have a slightly noisier spectrum because there we have interference between these two processes, whereas above this in, uh, energy, the spectrum is comparatively clean. There is some residual structure, which is due to intermediate excited states of the neutral, which are also important, which I also will come back to later. Now, the next complication is that when we ionize from xenon, we have multiple possible channels which, which we can ionize into. Um, so uh, we will mainly consider here the 5p uh, j equals 3 half and 5p j equals 1 half channels. Uh, we will have then one ATI series associated with, associated with each ionization channel. And the spin orbit splitting between these two channels uh, is approximately 1.3 electron volts, which, which will have a quantum beat period time of about 3.2 femtoseconds, which is a very quick uh, oscillation compared to the laser fields that we will be using. Um, mm, mm, mm. And then, yeah, right. So we will mainly consider three pathways for the photoelectron. One is direct ionization into the three half continuum uh, or three half channel. Uh, two is uh, ionization into the one half channel. And three is scattering from uh, the three half channel into the one half channel. And it's important to note that the scattering, which is medi mediated by the Coulomb interaction conserves the total energy, which is indicated by the horizontal uh, line of the process. Uh, on the process here. And it also conserves the overall parity of the system. Uh, <clears throat> this means that this, the photoelectron peak appearing here will have the same parity as the photoelectron peak appearing here. We can now redraw this uh, same process on a, from a slightly different viewpoint where we instead focus on the photoelectron kinetic energy. So we have the zero line here. Uh, and then we see that the ATSI series will become staggered in photoelectron energy. Um, we then see that when we're using photo, photon energies, which are similar to the spin orbit splitting, uh, photoelectron peaks appearing at similar kinetic energies will require absorption of different number of photons. So five in the three half channel, because this has a lower ionization potential and six in the one half channel. Uh, and this will then imply that uh, this peak will have different parity from this peak. And then we ask ourselves the question, does this mean that we will not have ionic coherence between these two channels? Uh, another problem is that, well, you can of course say that if you have a short enough pulse, then you will have uh, energetic overlap between, between the five peak and the seven peak in the other channel because they are broad enough, but we are actually interested in rather long pulses, which are longer, far longer than the quantum beat period. So this seems like it's a problem. Um, this particular process was actually studied a few years ago by Stefan Papst. Um, in his case, he's keeping the photon energy fixed at about 0.65 electron volts, and he has a moderate duration of his uh, electric field, uh, which gives a spectral uncertainty of about uh, 0.1 electron volt. And then in his model, he can instead tune the spin orbit splitting. So this valley here exactly corresponds to one photon um, being at the same size as the spin orbit splitting. And as we would expect, the coherence, coherence between the, the degree of coherence between the two ion channel goes, th goes down. It's not exactly zero, so it could be explained by, uh, by the spectral uncertainty. But we will now focus on exactly this region. And here are some uh, results. Uh, here is an angle resolved uh, ATI spectrum from xenon, and it's calculated for a 1.6 electron volt uh, photon energy and moderate strength field and a rather long duration. Uh, 
the xenon atom is modeled using a relativistic effective core potential. With, so we only have to treat the two outermost shells and we actually only allow ionization from the 5s and the 5p electrons. With this particular pseudo potential, we will get uh, ionization potentials which are fairly close to the experimental values. Uh, now I show you then the uh, sorry angle integrated uh, ATI spectra resolved on the two different ionic channels, 5p3 half and 5p1 half for a 30 femtosecond uh, pulse. And here is the energy resolved coherence between these two states. And this is uh, not at all zero. Um, we can then sweep the photon energy over a range and calculate the degree of coherence by integrating the uh, energy resolved coherence over the energy. Um, and then of course, normalizing to the population in each of the channels. And as we see, we get something which is uh, rather structured and definitely non-zero. It's on the order of a few percent. And interestingly enough, if we then increase the pulse duration, we increase the coherence, which is maybe contrary to the int intuitive picture that when we have a longer pulse, we should be able to spectrally resolve the different ionic channels. So why is this possible? Um, we return to this uh, di um, pictorial um, diagram of the, of the two channels. And as we said before, we expect that photoelectrons of similar kinetic energies will have different parity. Is there a way we can somehow during the process promote uh, the channels in energy without changing the parity such we can force this peak, for instance, to like climb up to this energy instead. There is something uh, called a Raman transition, um, specifically a Stokes Raman transition where we absorb a blue photon and emit a red photon comparatively. Um, and if we, uh, we will then gain a slight, a small energy increase. And if we do this n times, we can then increase the energy by n times this energy difference. But the important thing is that the parity is unchanged because we absorbed one photon and emitted one photon. So the idea is that it would look something like this. And then we will get uh, an additional ATI ladder starting from the intermediate state instead. Um, and this is resonant multi-photon ionization and the peaks will, are usually called prima resonances. We use them in a slightly non-orthodox way here. Uh, this explanation, however, is rather complicated. So we would actually need to prove that this is, um, this is um, the case. So what we can do is we can forbid this process. And we do this by uh, preventing the one of the excited states to partake in laser interaction. And we do this by forming a projector onto one of the states and P is the projector onto the orthogonal complement. So every time we propagate the laser interaction, we actually project out this state. Um, and this state is uh, actually uh, mainly in the three half channel, but also uh, a little bit in the one half channel. And if we do this um, and repeat the scan over photon energies, we see that the degree of coherence between the channels actually goes down. Um, this proves that this state is actually crucial in forming the degree of coherence between the two states. Um, it's not perfectly zero uh, for a few reasons. Um, more than one excited state is partaking in this, in this uh, ATI um, Raman Freeman process. So we're only removing one, we cannot expect the degree of coherence to go down. It's also the, or a complementary picture is that the field free state is not an eigenstate of the atom plus laser field. So you should actually remove the, uh, an excited state of atom plus laser field, but that's more complicated. Uh, so this brings me to my conclusions. Um, Freeman resonance and Raman transitions uh, break the symmetry in API, which enables coherence where parity would intuitively forbid it. These resonance structures are resilient to pulse duration and intensity. Uh, we have a manuscripted preparation for this. 
I would like to acknowledge funding on, from Olenkvist Stiftelse, uh, scholarship that uh, uh, financed my postdoc studies in Berlin. And then I would like to acknowledge the Theoretical Light Matter Dynamics Group at Lund University. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thanks a lot, Stefanos, for your talk. Very interesting. So questions. First, we have a question by Nicola Maya. Please uh, go ahead. Hi, hi. Hi, Stefanos, for a nice talk. Um, I wanted to ask you something. So uh, the Stokes-Raman process that you described, uh, isn't it in some sense a time-dependent uh, start shift? Because you have a... Uh, you mm -hmm. have a you have time dependence in the sense that you have a finite pulse, so you will have a spectral yep. bandwidth, and if you gain energy or you lose energy, due to the start shift, this kind of means uh, that you are absorbing uh, longer wavelength photons and then emitting uh, in the, or vice versa, or, so depending or, on yeah, if you yeah. go up or not. No. Is it yeah. a correct way of seeing this? Yeah, so actually, um, to be able to gain like an infinitesimal amount of energy, which you would need if you have a really long pulse, you actually need states which are infinitesimally close. And this you don't have in a field-free atom. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you add the field, you slosh around all the states. So you get like a quasi-continuum. And this is exactly the easy start shift. Okay. And, and so then what, what you're seeing is effectively also a sort of difference between start shifts from the free half and one half. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a, of... yeah, that's an alternative perspective, I think. Okay. Okay. I was trying to see if I understood. Thank you anyway for a nice talk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, any other question? Uh, okay, so I, I'm just curious um, about the method you are using. You, If I understood mm -hmm. correctly, you are using some pseudo potentials, right? Or you are using some kind of something similar to TDCIS or yeah, something like that? Yeah, it's TDCIS, so it's... Um single ionization from a Hartree-Fock reference, but the Hartree-Fock reference is computed using the pseudo potential. I see, I see. Now I understand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so this gives us scalar and vector uh, relativistic correction. So it, uh, exactly. it gives the spin orbit split. Okay, but then the relativistic correction are introduced uh, implicitly using the, the, you know, the operator, the spin orbit co uh, operator, yeah. or using the Iraq equation, just the spin orbit. It's, it's a two component Hartree Fox. So it's non relativistic, but it has relativistic corrections, which are uh -huh. in, introduced using the pseudo potential, okay. which is constructed from uh, fit by fitting to Dirac Fock calculations. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So if there are no any other questions, thanks again, Stefanos. Uh, for the talk. So next uh, is the turn for Nicola Meyer. Hello again. Uh, mm -hmm. He's from the Max Born Institute in Berlin. And he's going to talk about imprinting chirality on atoms using synthetic chiral, li chiral light. Okay, too many things in a short title. Okay, uh, <laughs> go ahead. The stage is yours. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. And now you see the slides, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Juan, for the introduction. And let me start by also thanking the organizers to, for having put up such a nice symposium and for allowing me to present my work. Um, I'm from the Max Born Institute in Berlin, and the title, as you can see, is Imprinting Chirality on Atoms Using Chiral Fields. So let me give you a brief outline of uh, what I'm going to talk about. So I will first tell you what it really means to have chiral atoms. Uh, I will then show you how it's possible to excite uh, such atoms. Um, and I will show you what kind of fields we actually need to do so. Uh, I will then show you uh, two results. Uh, one, a creation of a 10 dependent chiral wave packet uh, in sodium. And another one, uh, the other result will be um, basically an introduction of a measure that allows you to characterize the handedness of your field and in, uh, the imprinted handedness on the atom via the 3D photoelectron spectrum in the case of strong field ionization. So uh, atoms are usually thought as uh, a chiral object, but as shown in this work by Andres Ordonez and Olga Smirnova, there are, do exist uh, particular superposition of atomic states that display chirality. Uh, an example of this, let me use my pointer. 
an example of this is this kind of superpositions, the chi p plus and chi p minus uh, superposition. You can see that this is a two state superposition of a p plus and a d plus state, where p and d refer to an angular momentum of one and two, respectively, and plus refers to the projection of the angular momentum or the m quantum number equal to one. So the, now the superposition of two states with opposite parity, L equal one and L equal two, breaks the inversion symmetry. And as a result, you have a polarization of the wave function along an axis, along the z-axis. So you can see here, this is represented as this polar vector in green. Um, now, uh, the combination of this feature with M equal one uh, quantum number, uh, or rather, the M equal one quantum number uh, implies also an azimuthal probability current that spirals in the clockwise uh, direction in the XY plane, as shown here, uh, where I show you the isosurface of the state colored according to its uh, phase. And the combination of these two features uh, results in this compound sign that has actually an endedness. And you can convince yourself by trying to uh, superimpose this one on this one by simply rotating the figure. And you can see that this left enantiomer, the corresponding left enantiomer is related by basic an inversion of one of, uh, of these two features, which in this case is the polar vector, which just corresponds to the change of sign between the two states. So the, the way that now this chirality presents itself or rather can be displays itself in a possible experiment is for example, in a forward backward asymmetry of photoelectron emission. That is, if you now do one photoionization from the state with a circularly polarized pulse in the XY plane propagating in the Z direction, depending on the headedness of, the, of your, of your uh, wave function, you will have that the photoelectron will fly along the positive Z direction or the negative Z direction along the laboratory, uh, where the Z is the laboratory axis. Um, so yeah, so this is how the chirality uh, appears in an atom. Now, in order to understand how to actually imprint, uh, or rather to excite this uh, particular superposition, we have to think in terms of photon pathways. And you can see here that uh, I'm going to use a ground state that is an S state, so kind of like a nitrogenic case. And I'm just use, going to use the selection rules for uh, absorption of photons in the atomic case, that is the parity has to change every time uh, that you absorb one photon, and then the co corresponding M uh, quantum number has to change according to the polarization of your field. So in order to go from an S to a P plus state, you just need to absorb a photon that is right sequently polarized here at two omega frequency. Now, if you want to, uh, to excite a D plus state, you need to absorb two photons because it has same parity as the ground state. One that is circularly polarized, again, right sequently polarized, such that it brings you from the S to the P plus state. And one that is polarized along the Z axis, such that it brings you from the P plus to the D plus state. So uh, summing up, what we need is actually a field that carries three different types of polarization. One that is at omega frequency right circularly polarized, one that is at omega frequency and polarized along the z-axis, and one that is at two omega frequency and again right circularly polarized. So one way to create this kind of field is to cross uh, two beams at an angle. In particular here, I'm choosing uh, a beam that is a two omega frequency, a right circularly polarized in its local frame, propagating along the, the, the Z direction. And now I cross this field, I can't, or rather this, uh, this field is crossed by another field at omega frequency that is again, right circularly polarized in its local frame that crosses it at an angle alpha. And here at the point where these two uh, fields meet, you will obtain uh, this uh, expression for the total electric field. You consider it as non-zero components along the, uh, the three directions. And that in the XY plane, it's elliptically polarized in general, both at omega and two omega frequency, but moreover, it also has a, a forward component due to the projection of this uh, of this omega uh, field along the, the direction of propagation of the two omega. Uh, that is, uh, that gives you the Z polarized photon at omega frequency. And this type of light was uh, first thought uh, in the, this work by David Ayuso, published in 2019. And it's an example of, uh, of uh, light that is chiral in the dipole approximation. And he called, he called it a synthetic chiral light. And it's chiral in the sense that the Lissajou curve that the polarization vector draws over one period of the laser field draws a chiral Lissajou curve uh, in, the in the three dimensional uh, space. And so you can see here also that is that the handedness actually of this light is determined by the relative phase between the two fields. So that when the relative phase is equal to zero, this relative phase, um, you will have one handedness. And when the relative phase is instead pi, you will have the opposite handedness. Um, now, before introducing the results, um, so just summing up until now, basically what we see is that we really need uh, light that is chiral in the dipole approximation in order to imprint chirality on an atom. 
Um, now, before introducing the results, let me slightly generalize what we saw until now uh, regarding chirality in atoms. And so let me consider the case of time dependent chiral superposition. So, in a, in a two state case, again, time dependence means that the two states are not degenerate. So, what it means is now that the relative phase between the two fields will evolve on a period defined by an energy difference between the two states. And now, as I showed you before, the handedness of, of, uh, uh, of the light is that of this chiral wave function is determined by the relative phase between two fields, which basically means that your uh, polar vector in green is uh, swapping between going, uh, is basically inverting. And what it means is also that the, since the handedness of now of this superposition will change every half cycle, also we expect that the photoelectron, uh, uh, the photoelectron will fly out once we uh, probe this uh, chiral wave function with a circularly polarized pulse, will also fly out in opposite directions every alpha cycle. So we expect basically a PCD signal to be also oscillating on the period uh, given by the difference between the energies of the state. And so here I summarize what I just said. So you see that time zero, let's say you have a certain endedness, after alpha period, you have the opposite endedness, and after the full period, you get back the original handedness. And, and again, and now if you probe this, uh, this handedness at different times with the same probe, you should see that the photoelectron's uh, secret dichroism will swap in Simon's mind. And, and therefore, we, what we're going to do is to basically do a pump probe a PCT experiment where you have a chiral pump pass at, at a certain time, and then you arrive later with a securely polarized probe in the X-ray plane with a various time delay that will now um, uh, probe this, uh, the handedness of the light at different times. So uh, this is indeed what I did. I did this simulation in sodium. Uh, we chose sodium because sodium is a rather low ionization potential, which means that you can uh, reach the, the rebirth states and the continuum using the few photon transition that I showed you. And in particular, we aim our uh, parameters in order to excite a 4P 3D uh, rebirth wave packet. Um, and the, the energy difference between these two states is such that the handedness should evolve on a period of roughly 38 femtoseconds. Um, so in order to do this, we use the 660 plus 350 nanometers corrotating chiral pump pulse, whose Lichas curve looks like this for one of the two handedness, uh, a rather low intensity in order to not completely ionize uh, your atom, and an angle between the two fields of 45 degrees, where we choose the laboratory axis to be directed, the uh, z-axis to be directed on the direction of propagation of the two omega. And as a probe, we use 800 nanometer uh, right or left circularly polarized probe in the XY plane, co-propagating with the two omega. And we are going to focus on the signal along the z-axis or along the propagation direction of two omega, because we know that that's where uh, the uh, handedness will be imprinted, or rather the chirality of your, of your experiment uh, will be easier to detect. And so here are the, the results. Uh, right and left in antimers correspond again to different phases of your chiral pump pulse when one is zero and the other one is pi. Um, you can see here that uh, also I have right and uh, circularly polarized and left circularly polarized probe that is the photoelectron coming from ionization from either field uh, from right or left circularly polarized probe. You can see that the amplitudes are uh, rather different depending on the handedness of your probe. This is because of uh, one photon uh, um, or rather propensity rules. That is if the if your handedness of the way that the uh, current Spirals in the xy direction in the in the in the xy plane of the of your wave of your current wave function is orbiting in the same sense of your probe. You will have enhanced uh, photoelectrons uh, and uh, and uh, vice versa if uh, if it uh, if the probe and the and the probability current of your wave function uh, spirals in opposite directions. Uh, but more importantly, you can see that now once you take the PCD signal, you will have this very clear oscillation on the 40 femto. 38 femtosecond timescale, which really confirms the fact that we created a pen dependent chiral wave packet and that we can probe it by a PCD experiment. Now, um, let me now cover the case of strong field ionization, as I said before, and also introduce this way of uh, characterizing the handedness or uh, imprinted on the photoelectro wave packet and also on the handedness of the light that we used in order to imprint chirality in an atom. So, in a strong field case, we know that now by neglecting, let's say, the Coulomb, the, the Coulomb uh, uh, potential, that the final momentum uh, detector, the detector is largely determined by the vector potential at the time of ionization. 
And as I said, the, this light is chiral in the sense that the Lissajous curve draws a chiral curve. So now this time momentum mapping suggests immediately that by characterizing the final photoelectron momentum in, in the proper way, we can characterize uh, the vector potential at time of ionization so that we have really a mapping between the time that the electron is ionized by that chiral vector potential at time ti and the final momentum detector. And uh, in order to characterize the headedness, we then have to look for a pseudo scalar that is a scalar, uh, a quantity that is a scalar quantity, but that changes sign when you uh, change handedness. And we find this pseudo scalar by simply taking the scalar product between the free Cartesian components of your final momentum. And now we weigh this uh, uh, pseudo scalar for the corresponding magnitude square of your photon amplitude and integrate over all uh, final momenta. And then uh, in order to simplify things, we just take the sign function of this, uh, of this and, and we hope to see that it changes sign uh, when, uh, when you change handedness. So I verified this by doing both classical trajectory simulation and attendant dependent Schrodinger equation simulations. Uh, here I show you the classical trajectories on a hydrogen-like atom driven by a strong 800 and 400 nanometer uh, electric field, where now the two fields are actually counter-rotating with respect to each other in the XY plane, and the carol Lissajous curve looks like this. And again, the, the angle between the two fields is 45 degrees. Um, so you can see here the final um, uh, uh, momentum distribution from the classical trajectories for the right and left enantiomers. You can already kind of convince yourself here that they're chiral, but we also see that the, um, the uh, pseudo scalar that we introduced changes sign. And this not only confirms the validity of this chiral measure, but also confirms the fact that we are indeed imprinting chirality on your final um, uh, photoelectron when you uh, arrive with a chiral field. And uh, TDC simulations confirm again this picture, same parameters. Um, now I show you the slices for the photoelectric triangular distribution where PZ again is uh, the direction of propagation of the two, uh, is along is the mom momentum along the direction of propagation of your uh, two omega field. And you can see that of course in two dimensions, um, uh, the handedness, uh, uh, the different handedness uh, show themselves as simply an inversion in two dimensions. And you can see also that the, the two uh, um, pseudo scalars that we can characterize the final full 3D photoelectric momentum distribution uh, also change the sign. And again, so TDC simulation confirm what we saw in the classical trajectories, and we are actually imprinting chirality on the photoelectron wave packet. And finally, before concluding, let me just show you a focus on this feature. So you can see here that there is this five-fold feature and one could ask yourself where it comes from. It actually comes from a, a Freeman resonance as, uh, that was already touched upon by Stefanos in the previous uh, talk. So a Freeman resonance is simply when you have a Libra state that becomes uh, resonant with a multi-photon uh, transition from the ground state uh, due to the star shift. And in, part in this particular case, we know that at this at the intensity that we chose for our pulse, we have a 10 photon resonant with an equal free Libra state, which gives you indeed this low energy structure, which is, um, which is this five foil uh, feature. And you can also see that here the PCD signal corresponding PCD signal for the slices. And, and so this basically confirms the fact that we can also use Freeman resonances as, as a way to imprint chirality on an atom, and also that this will also appear in the final photoelectric moment distributions. Uh, with this, I reach my conclusion. So I show you the synthetic chiral fields can be used to excite chiral atomic superpositions. Um, uh, I showed you the results that confirm the fact that we are able to create a 10 dependent chiral superposition in uh, sodium that was exhibited time varying the handedness. And finally, I also showed you that a three dimensional photoelectron spectrum can be used to characterize the handedness imprinted on electronic wave packet by the synthetic chiral light. And with this, I would like to thank you all for listening and also my collaborators, Misha Ivanov, Olga Zbirnova, and Sergei Pachkovsky from the MBI group, and also the previous PhD and postdoc that were at our um, group that now left, but that uh, did very important work on uh, without which I would not have been able to show you what I showed you today. So Andres uh, Ordonez and David Ayuso. And with this, um, I'm open for questions. And thanks again, the organizer, for allowing me to present this work. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for such a interesting talk so um are there any questions suggestions concerns
I have one question. If, mm -hmm. Could you please go to uh, go back in your slides, please? Yes. A little bit. It's. Uh, I will tell you just a little bit more. Is where you show the dependency on the, there here. Yeah. So here, what, what do you mean? R enantiomer and L enantiomer. You refer to the sodium atom, right? To the. Yeah, I mean. Uh, to the state of the electron in the three S. Uh, no, so the here the enantiomer is referred uh, so the simulations are done like this. Basically, uh, in one case you have sodium in its ground state, and now you just uh, arrive with a chiral pump whose relative phase between the two fields is zero, and this is what I mean by uh, right enantiomer. And the left enantiomer is just the same simulation, but now for a chiral uh, pump pulse whose relative phase between the two, uh, the two fields is equal to pi, such that you have the whole. I see. So of by enantiomer you refer to the chiral state of the light not the system yes but he this ah. really shows that then this uh, this handedness is imprinted then on the on the sodium atom because then the you have uh if 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 the if this would not be imprinted on the sodium atom the handedness then the piece signal signal will not appear and this really shows you that you have different handedness at time zero basically but okay, you start but with different handedness once the chiral pump pulse arrive but then this this chiral line you you construct uh, depends on two two beans at a certain degree that I think you, you label as alpha. Uh, if you set alpha to zero, this angle, then you will have the usual um, yeah, rotating. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between using this or what is the advantages of using this kind of chiral light instead of using co a co-rotating circularly polarized beam? Where you, this is also chiral, in the sense that circularly polarized light is chiral. Well, it's chiral, but not in the dipole approximation. Right, because the chirality is encoded by the fact that it's actually propagating one direction and that it's uh, uh, circularly polarized in the x plane. But uh, okay, it's really then, propagated. And um, here it's really chiral in the diaper approximation because basically you can see that if you would not have this z component, so if basically if your field would not have non zero components along the free Cartesian uh, uh, coordinates, then you will not be able to excite the 3D plus state, which means that then. You will not be able to create a wave function that is actually chiral. I see, because then you include a component in the propagation. Yeah, basically, or that's what you, would, yeah. This is how you include it in the. Dipole. Well, I mean, there is no there is no propagation in my simulations because they are done in diaper approximation. Yeah. It's really that the field is so uh, the 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 yeah. time dependent Schrodinger equation is solved at that point, and that point the the field has. No, no I understand. Point My point is that you have contributions in the three directions of space in X, Y, yes. Z, something that you don't have because it's constrained on a plane in the co rotating yes. thing. Okay, now, okay, okay. Thanks. Um, any other question? Okay, then it's uh, 5 to 11. So let's start in 20 minutes at uh, quarter past 11. Okay, so. Thanks a lot, everyone, and see you in 20 minutes. Enjoy your coffee. So welcome back, and everybody. Uh, welcome again to the second part of the first session today. And now our speaker is Dino Habibovic. He is teaching assistant at the physics department at the university in Sarajevo. I guess it's Sarajevo, right, in Bosnia? <laughs> OK, like in Spanish, easy. Yes, right. <laughs> And he's at his final year in his PhD on uh, laser atom and laser molecule interactions. He's uh, currently a member of some office. That's the, the group led by Professor Dejan Milosevic. And he's going to talk to us uh, about tailored fields interacting with quantum systems. So thanks, Dino, for for your participation and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, is everything okay? Do you see my screens properly? Everything is perfect. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very, very much for the, or, to the organizers for having me here today. Uh, and in this talk, I will speak about strong field processes driven by tailored laser fields. Uh, okay, just a moment. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, I'm talking about strong field processes driven by tailored laser fields, and here is an outline of my presentation. 
Uh, well, in the first part of my presentation, I will talk about strong field processes in general. Uh, also, I will mention the strong field approximation, which is the approach I used in order to calculate the uh, quantities of interest. Uh, in the second part of my presentation, I will talk about tailored laser fields. In particular, I will state the main advantages of these fields with respect to the linearly polarized laser field. And finally, in order to illustrate the effects of... Um, uh, excuse taking... me, Dino, just a sec. I, I think your slides are frozen, maybe. We can uh, see just... Is that okay? Uh, no, we <laughs> try to stop sharing and sharing again uh, because this looks like frozen and we see a, we see a pop-up menu in just a second okay yes try to share again okay let me try once again um now uh is everything okay now i cannot see the slides uh, just a second Mm -hmm. It said that I'm sharing uh, that I'm sharing my screen here. No, but no, but here it says that you are starting sharing the screen, but it's not. I guess you are using a Mac. Uh, right? Yeah. Uh, so maybe this is the key uh, thing. Uh, do you see now the slides? No. No. Mm -hmm. Try something else or using some other app, I don't know. Just a second, please. Uh, let me try with... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really... Uh-huh, let me see. Okay. Because yesterday it was fine on a... Yes. Uh, okay, not really sure. Just a moment. Okay, uh, once again. Um, now, now. You see now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so now you can try to pull in full screen yes, or if it's problematic. You Is can it try. better now? Okay, now it's fine. It's Please. fine, okay. Thank Go you. ahead again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, um, the presentation is about strong field processes driven by tailored laser fields. And I said that in the first part, I will talk about laser induced processes and strong field approximation, which I used in order to explain the process and to calculate the quantities of interest. In the second part of my presentation, I will talk about tailored laser fields and the main advantages of these fields. And finally, to illustrate the effects of the Taylor laser fields, I will use the examples of high order harmonic generation and high order about threshold ionization. Okay, uh, so let me start now. Uh, well, when we are talking about strong field processes, uh, generally speaking, these processes can be divided into two groups. Uh, the first group uh, is the laser assisted processes, while the second group uh, is the laser-induced processes. Well, in this talk, I'm particularly interested for the laser-induced processes, the processes which are happening only in the strong laser field, and uh, the particularly important examples of these processes are the HHG and HATI processes. Uh, well, in order to explain the physics, the underlying physics, it's usual to use the so-called uh, three-step model, and in a three-step model, in the first step, the atomic or molecular system is ionized under the influence of the strong laser field. Then in the, in the second step, the electron propagates in the laser field. However, due to the oscillatory character of the laser field, there is a possibility that the electron returns to the parent ion, and then few scenarios can happen. Well, one of the scenarios which is possible is that the return electron recombines with the parent ion uh, and the energy excess is emitted in the form of the high energy photon. Uh, this scenario is responsible for the high order harmonic generation. 
And the second scenario is, the, is that the electron is rescattered off the parent ion and then propagates even further, uh, even further in the laser field. Uh, okay, uh, now when we are talking about when we are talking about laser fields, uh, the simplest configuration which can be used in order to induce the laser field processes is the so-called monochromatic linearly polarized laser field. Uh, of course, uh, the generalization of a monochromatic field is a bichromatic laser field, linearly polarized once again. And finally, it's possible if the laser pulse is short enough, um, then it's necessary to well describe the envelope of the laser pulse, and these pulses are called the few cycle laser pulses. However, what we want now is to introduce the second dimension. Uh, because when we are using the linearly polarized monochromatic or bichromatic laser field, uh, it's only one dimensional field, but what we want is to introduce the second dimension, and uh, the easiest way to do that is by using the elliptically polarized laser field, because in that case you have the second uh, dimension. However, what's the problem, uh, it's not the problem, but it, what's the drawback? is that still you have only one frequency and only one intensity of the elliptically polarized field. Uh, the tailored laser fields are the bichromatic elliptically polarized laser fields, and the main advantage of these fields with respect to the linearly and elliptically polarized laser field is that uh, there are many more parameters which can be used in order to um, uh, control the process, the laser-induced process. Because uh, for a linearly polarized laser field, we only have the intensity and the frequency or wavelength as you want. Um, however, now we have the intensities, ellipticities, and frequencies of both laser field components. Then uh, you have some additional parameters, and the particularly important parameter is the uh, relative phase, the relative phase between the two laser field uh, components. Uh, now, the most prominent examples of these fields, tailored laser fields, are the bicircular laser field, uh, which is the field which consists of two circularly polarized laser fields, and uh, for this talk, particularly interesting one, is the orthogonally polarized two-color laser field, or, or the so-called OTC laser field. Uh, well, uh, the OTC laser field consists of two linearly polarized components, as you can see here, and those components are with commensurable frequencies and mutually orthogonal polarizations. Uh, here is the relative phase phi between the two laser field components, and in this talk I will particularly devote my attention to the effects of this relative, of this relative phase to the, um, some characteristics of the high-order harmonic generation and HATI processes. Okay, here you have uh, some parameters which can be used in order to control, to control the process, and um, it's important to stress this, that if you have the molecular targets instead of the atomic targets, then the additional parameters have to be introduced, have to be taken into account. And those parameters are the um, Euler, ang Euler angles, because uh, uh, th uh, those parameters are the parameters which determine the relative position of the molecule with respect to the laser field. If you have a, a diatomic molecule, it's uh, only one Euler angle is necessary to describe the process, but if you have the polyatomic molecule, all three angles have to be taken into account. Uh, okay, uh, now I start with my first point, and my first point is uh, how the uh, harmonic intensity and the harmonic ellipticity uh, can be controlled uh, using the relative phase as the parameter. Uh, here, uh, I have used the omega-3 omega OTC laser field as an example, and I have used the nitrogen molecule and two molecule in these, uh, in these slides, in the left column, uh, and here in the right column, I have used the argon atom uh, as an example. Uh, as you can see here in the upper panels, I have presented the uh, logarithm of the harmonic intensity, and in the lower panel, the harmonic ellipticity as functions of the relative phase and the harmonic order. What is clear now is that both quantities, the harmonic intensity and the harmonic ellipticity, strongly depend on the relative phase 
uh, for example, there are regions with large harmonic intensity, there are regions where the high energy photons can be expected and so on and so forth. In addition, uh, the, the harmonics, uh, the emitted harmonics are elliptically polarized, what's good for, for the experimental use. And the harmonics are elliptically polarized even for the atomic targets, what's not the case for the linearly polarized laser field. However, the regions with large ellipticity are even broader if we use diatomic molecular targets instead of the, instead of the atomic targets. Uh, what is particularly important is to uh, somehow assess the regions with large harmonic intensity, because those regions are important from the experimental point of view. And in order to do that, it is possible to use the semi, it's possible to use actually the classical model, the so-called Simplemans model, uh, in which we uh, treat the electron classically, like the electron moves, um, uh, treat it with uh, solving the Newton equation of motion. So here in the right part of this figure, I have presented the enlarged part from the previous figure from these. This part is shown here enlarged because as you can see, the harmonic order goes from 120 to 200. And the yellow line corresponds to the classical estimate of the maximal harmonic energy, maximal harmonic order, while the white line corresponds to the maximal harmonic intensity. It's clear that the uh, classical results can be used to assess the regions with large ellipticity and large, uh, large intense harmonic intensity. Uh, sometimes it can be interesting to have, uh, it can be beneficial to have the regions with large ellipticity, which are much broader. And in, we have checked that uh, if we want uh, to have uh, a broader region in the relative phase harmonic order plane, which corresponds to the high, high harmonic ellipticity, it's better to use the polar molecules, the heteronuclear molecules than the homonuclear molecules. And here, for example, I have presented the results for the CO molecule, which is a heteronuclear diatomic molecule. Uh, I have used now the omega-2 omega OTC laser field as an example. And as you can see here, both odd and even harmonics are emitted. Um, the left panel corresponds to the odd harmonics, while the right panel corresponds to the even harmonics. And here, uh, it's clear that the regions with large ellipticity are much broader. However, this is not the rule, because if you are using, for example, the NO molecule, the um, and O molecule leads to, again, to broader regions, but still the CO molecule is, is, is a better candidate in order to produce the uh, large ellipticity, the high order harmonics, the large ellipticity. Uh, finally, here is important to stress uh, that these regions are not only in the high energy part of the spectra, they are also in the lower energy part of the spectra. And that's important because the high energy part of the spectra is usually suppressed when you take the, uh, into account the macroscopic effects. Okay, my second point for today is that uh, besides the harmonic intensity and harmonic ellipticity, uh, the shape of the high order harmonic spectra can also be controlled uh, using the relative phase. As an example here in the left panel, now I use the CO2 molecule, the conclusions are similar for other atomic and molecular systems. And as you can see here, for example, for the values of the relative phase, 0, 30, 120 degrees, uh, the shape of the spectrum is an oscillatory. The uh, spectrum has an oscillatory character, while for the relative phase around 60 degrees and some other values, this is only the example, uh, um, the 60 degrees corresponds to the green line here, dash dotted green line. Uh, it's clear that the shape of the spectrum is smooth. The spectrum is smooth, uh, which means that the uh, high order harmonics are phase locked in those parts of the spectra, and uh, those parts can be used in order to produce the other second, the other second pulse. Here, uh, the, the red line corresponds to the other second pulse produced using the OTC laser field, while the, for comparisons, the uh, black line, the dashed black line, corresponds to the at the second pulse produced with the, uh, with the linearly polarized laser field. The harmonics in the OTC laser field are, the phase locking of harmonics is, is much better than for, for the linearly polarized field. 
Uh, of course, uh, all these things can be explained using the quantum orbit theory, but that's for some other for some other talk. And finally, for the as the third point for today, uh, I would like to say that besides the harmonic intensity ellipticity, the HATI spectra, the spectra of the emitted photoelectrons, also strongly depends on the relative phase of the OTC laser field. Uh, this dependence is similar for various molecules, N2, O2, uh, CO, NO, and so on and so forth. Uh, as you can see here, for example, for the values of the relative phase around, let's say, 45 degrees, uh, the high energy electrons can be expected in the spectra, while for the, for example, 130 degrees, even the middle energy electrons are strongly suppressed uh, in the spectra. Uh, the low energy electrons, the so-called direct electrons, the ATI spectra, is less disturbed uh, by the relative phase because those electrons spend uh, far less time in the laser field than the rescattered electrons. The relative phase uh, mostly disturbs the electrons which are rescattered of the parent ion. Uh, okay, so in conclusion, uh, we can say uh, that uh, in this talk, I focused my attention only to the relative phase between the laser field components, and it is really the important parameter, probably the most important parameter for the OTC laser field. However, many other parameters, are, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, can also be used to control the process, particularly, for example, um, the ratio of the intensities of the laser field components. And um, okay, uh, the emitted harmonics are elliptically polarized, um, even for the atomic targets. For the molecular targets, the, the harmonics are uh, elliptically polarized, even for the linearly polarized laser field. However, here, um, uh, the, even for the atomic targets, they are elliptically polarized. I must stress that this depends on the frequencies of the laser field components, because for the atomic targets and omega-2 omega laser field, the harmonics are linearly polarized, one in the direction of the omega component and the other uh, the even in the direction of the omega and uh, the odd in the direction of omega and even in the direction to omega. Uh, however, uh, it's possible to find the combinations uh, for which the harmonics are elliptically polarized. In addition, uh, or as a result, because the harmonics are elliptically polarized, the atta second pulse, the elliptically polarized atta second pulse uh, can be generated. And also the rescattered photoelectron spectra can be controlled uh, using this parameter. As a potential generalizations of this field, I will mention two generalizations. Uh, the first one is the generalization which assumes that the angle between the laser field components is not equal to 90 degrees. Because the OTC laser field, the components are mutually orthogonal, but it's also possible that the, the angle is an arbitrary angle between them. And the second generalization is to introduce the ellipticities, the so-called b-elliptical laser field, to introduce the ellipticities of the laser field components in that case, you can also control, you can also use uh, that quantity, the ellipticity of the components in order to control the process. Uh, okay, um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, please feel free to contact me if you need any further information. Thanks a lot for a very nice talk. Uh, so any questions or comments among the audience? So far, I don't see any. Okay, I have one question myself. You you have been discussing um, control over the phase. Did you try any systematic technique to maximize the emission of high harmonics? For example, I don't know, Krotov algorithm, something typical of optimal quantum control? Or are you thinking about it? Uh, okay, we are actually thinking about that. Uh, what we have done up to now is that we um, uh, tried to control uh, using the relative phase and the ratio of the intensities of the laser field components. We have tried to find the regions 
uh, for those values, the, the values of those parameters for which the harmonic intensity is maximal. Uh, what's the problem is that usually th those regions are in the high energy part of the spectra. And uh, for those parts, uh, the macroscopic effects, I think, should be introduced. Uh, maybe the results are um, the results are correct. Max uh, the, 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 the results are good, particularly for the low pressure gases. However, for other, the uh, macroscopic effects should be taken into account also. I see. Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, then thanks again for your talk. Um, the next speaker is Jean-Nicolas Vignon. Um, please, now you can uh, share your screen. Yes. Hello. Do you hear me well? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, okay. So Jean-Nicolas is... Um, He's working at the University of paris Clay in collaboration with the University of uh, Laval in Canada. So I was wondering, are you in Canada? No, right now I'm in uh, Paris. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. It's good not to be at 5 a.m., okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah. and, and he will talk us today about a strong field effects beyond the strong field ionization. So could you please share your slides? And, uh, yes, I'm trying to. And but... Let's see that everything works fine. I, I cannot seem to be able to share my screen. Uh, you the, the should, right. you are co-host, so you should be able to. Okay, now I can, great. Yes, perfect. Okay, okay great. So the story is yours, please um, go ahead. Thank you very much. Just a few seconds. Okay, well, thank you very much everyone for attending my presentation on the strong field molecular ionization beyond the single active electron approximation. My name is Jean-Nicolas Vigneault, and as you said, <laughs> Mr. Ran Wan, um, I'm working at the, uh, on a thesis at the Université Paris-Saclay in France in Côte-Stelle with the Université Laval in Quebec. So uh, as you all know, theoricians uh, use approximations all the time. Uh, first to be able to uh, put uh, experimental observations into analytical uh, formula formulates, formulations that can be used after this into uh, computational simulations. And uh, it's also very practical to be able to uh, gain some computational time and memory. And some widely used uh, of them are the Born-Oppenheimer approximation that considers the uh, nuclei as static compared to the uh, speed of the electrons, which permits us to uh, observe the ionization dynamic. There's also the strong field approximation uh, that we can use for the uh, ionization continuum. So uh, once the wave packet gets into the ionized continuum, we can consider it in a Volkov states that neglects the Coulomb potential of the molecule. And there's also the single active electron that uh, approximation that permits us to neglect the electronic correlation uh, during the ionization dynamic. And it is especially this last approximation that we tackle in our recent work. So to do so, we use a program that is called MEDIS for many electron dynamic system, which is a TDCI approach um to the uh, to tackle the problem so what it does is that it takes the uh, complete wave packet and partitions it into two uh, two parts so there's the bound states here that are represented with a configuration state functions with their proper coefficients and also the ionic uh, part that also contains uh, CS CSFs so configuration state functions with their uh, coefficient. And so using these two parts, when we apply the uh, Schrodinger's equation, uh, what we get is first, of course, the propagation of each part of the wave packet within their own space. But there also will be some exchanges between these two partitions, as it is schematized right here. Um, and so uh, to do so, of course, we use we need first to create 
those configuration state functions. And we do so using molecular orbitals that are uh, set here. So sigma g, sigma u, p u, and p uh, g. So um, using these four molecular orbitals, we will place our singlet electrons into either of the uh, molecular orbitals for the bound states. And we will also add a continuum plane wave uh, for one of the two electrons that will be ionized into this partition. So the parameters that concerns us, well, first we uh, do our calculations onto the dihydrogen that has two electrons and two nuclei. And uh, our model of assumption will be restricted to the single ionization description at fixed uh, internuclear distances, as said by the born oppenheimer approximations. So we set the uh, internuclear distances to 1.4, which is the equilibrium distance. We elongated a little bit the nuclei at five atomic units, and finally at 10.2 atomic units, with we consider as dissociated. Our basis set, as I said, is singlets, uh, and the bound states are uh, consist of 10 bound configuration state functions made of four molecular orbitals. And our uh, plane wave continuum will uh, be set, laid out as a grid. So we have uh, 400 by 600 points. And uh, this will permit us to generate 960,000 ionic CSFs. Uh, concerning the electronic correlation, uh, we implemented into the program an adiabatic switch on or switch off that consists of a sigmoid function that has uh, first values of correlation and, uh, and last values, so how the sigmoid will take place. Uh, we have the duration of the adiabatic switch off that is here set to uh, almost two femtoseconds, whilst the time step is of 1.3 attoseconds. So we can see how it is really adiabatic uh, in the differences, the order of differences of time. And uh, so our dynamic will be using an electric field that has an intensity of uh, the order that can go from 10 to the 15 up to 10 to the 16 uh, coming from zero so we're really doing a scan of intensity and we set three different wavelengths for our laser which are 790 nanometers 750 and 700 uh, the polarization is considered linear and always aligned with the internuclear distance and we are doing the uh, the uh, pulse of uh, four optic cycles, which consists of 10.5 femtosecond. And here, as you can see, the sigmoid function is really centered with the second highest maximum of the field. Uh, so uh, it will be at a time where the dynamic is really uh, led by the, the laser instead of the uh, Coulomb potential. And so using all these parameters, sorry, variables here that are the internuclear distance, the co electronic correlation, wavelength, and intensity, we will observe the final ionization probability. So if we take a look at the results, we have here the results for the equilibrium distance here of 1.4. So as we can see, there's really little difference between correlation that has been switched off and correlation that was uh, on since the beginning. Uh, we see some little wave here, but what really uh, surprises here is the sudden total ionization that occurs at really specific intensities uh, according to the wavelength selected of the laser. So we can safely deduce that it has to do with radiative interactions, but furthermore, we associated this with the above the barrier ionization, so ABI, in both cases. So it won't depend on the correlation. So how do we explain it? Is that, uh, as you know, there are two ionization regimes that uh, are in duality. There's tunneling ionization and multi-photonic. Um, so tunneling consisting of the passage of the wave packet through 
uh, a potential barrier here that is um, lowered by the uh, elect electronic field. But here what happens is that at such intensity, the barrier will be totally under the, uh, the uh, wave packet, the energy of the wave packet, which will allow it to di directly ionize totally without restriction. Now, if we go see the elongated molecule here at five ato ato sorry, atomic units, uh, we see a huge difference between correlation switched off and correlation on. Uh, we've got something smooth here with, without correlation. But once we add it, uh, what we see is that, uh, well, first, there will be a higher um, ionized population during the dynamic. But uh, we also see here a little quenching at certain intensities that vary uh, upon the wavelength. And to explain these, we refer to the resonance enhanced multiphoton ionization, so known as REMPI, and the overlapping interfering resonances that will be induced by the REMPI. So if we go take a look to the electronic, uh, sorry, energy diagram that we have here, we've got uh, the energy diagram for the equilibrium distance on the left and elongated on the right. Uh, well, on the left, uh, we won't really refer to it because the correlation is really low, as we've seen. But on the right, we can see that we've got our fundamental state and excited states here that are really near the uh, continua here. So we've got to absorb uh, multiple photons to get to these excited states intermediate. But once it reaches here, we only need uh, around one or two photon to directly ionize. So it will create a situation of resonance between this intermediate excited state and the continuum, uh, and hence the quenching at some specified intensities. Uh, if we continue with the dissociated molecule, so at 10.2, we can see uh, that even though the, the correlation when it's on is really higher than the case of the elongated molecule. The curves are uh, quite similar. I mean, there's a bit of difference into the ionized population, but we do not see the same type of quenching that we used to see with the uh, situation before. And this can be explained yet again using the energetic uh, diagram. So we've got here on the left, the elongated, and on the right, the dissociated. And so what we can see is that the excited states that we had previously at five atomic units are then uh, quite degenerated uh, between one another and even uh, nearer the continua here of ionization. Um, so uh, because of this degeneration here uh, and the fact that the fundamental state will be populated equally with uh, sigma g doubly occupied and sigma u doubly occupied. What happens is that uh, once there is, uh, let's say, excitation from sigma g to sigma u, one of the two sigma g's to sigma u, as we can see here, and one of the two sigma u to sigma g, in the other case, uh, we see that the interaction will be destructive uh, the interference between uh, the two kinds of excitations, which will, uh, in the end, uh, be, as I said, destructive. So there won't be any apparent changes on the, uh, the, these uh, excitations. So in summary, we are using a TDCI approach that permits us to temper with the uh, electronic correlation during the uh, ionization dynamic. And so uh, looking at the final ionization probability and using a wide range of variables, which are the internuclear distance, electronic correlation, and uh, sorry, wavelength and intensity, uh, we were able to uh, see really a wide range of results for uh, the ion ionization dynamic of H2, but especially an unexpected impact at the elongated a geometry of the molecule, which we are still investigating. So uh, we did not uh, already break 
break up uh, the whole simulation to see exactly what happens. But uh, it will, we will do and uh, probably publish uh, within the next few weeks or months about this subject. And so in perspective concerning the program itself, uh, we wish to implement uh, beyond Oppenheimer calculations. So involving uh, something like a nuclear dynamic. And we also wish to extract the ionization rates to be able to compare them with some uh, semi-classical models such as uh, MOADK and also MOPPT approaches. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you have some qu questions for me. Uh, it will be a pleasure to answer them for you. Thanks a lot, jean Nicola. Uh, very nice talk. So uh, since we have a little bit of delay, it would be great if anyone has any question, so to raise the hand very fast and efficiently. Okay, no question. So everything was very well understood, I guess. So I have one question. This medit, um, medis uh, code, uh, it's something you code in your group, right? Yes. Uh, have you applied this beyond the two electron systems? Because it, what you have shown us is the H2, and I guess it's not, it's a heavy method, right? The yeah. numerical effort is huge. Uh, have you tried to go beyond two electrons? Yes, so uh, to try to go beyond two electrons, uh, you mean here for the uh, beyond the bond of No, the mind? same calculations you have shown. Yeah. Uh, all this was was for H2, right? My point yes. is that in the bond of Heimer calculations, have you mm -hmm. gone beyond two electrons or? No, no, we restricted ourselves to uh, uh, H2. Okay. Yes, okay. using uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. I was curious about the performance. Okay. <laughs> So if there are no other questions, so thanks again. And okay, well then with this, we close this session. Thanks a lot to the Thank speakers. You. Everything was very interesting and me personally, I've learned a lot. Um, so then we will resume after the lunch break. We'll wait you then at 2 p.m. either.